It says, in the first year of Darius, the son of, what's his name, guys? That guy. Of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who, who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to, to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he, has, which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name. As it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. You guys can grab a seat. If you guys remember from last week, Daniel, Daniel is, is praying and he's making intercession for the people and he's speaking on behalf of all of Israel. And as Daniel prays, he includes himself in the, the falling short of Israel and what God had for them and the standard that God had. And as you see and you read this and you listen, you kind of, you see a lot of um, different words that all imply to God's word. So you hear judgments, statutes, precepts, uh, law, like all these words are just different varying ways of describing God's word, what God has commanded them as he spoke to them audibly, but also as he spoke to them through the prophets, through the judges, and as he spoke through Moses, and even as he spoke in a, in a sense, writing on the tablet, right? So for us, he speaks to us in the very same way because we have it written down as the word of God. And so he adds himself into the sins and the iniquities because they have fallen short. I don't want to say have fallen short. They have fallen short, but they have transgressed the law and the statutes and the precepts and the judgments and the words of God. And you see that Daniel keeps saying over and over and over again that we have not obeyed your voice. We have not obeyed the things that you've told us to do. And if you remember from last week, what was the one defining thing that caused them to be in this desolation or this disaster, as Daniel describes it both ways, um, for 70 years? What was the one thing that Israel did that caused that? They didn't let the land rest, right? Good job. 
If you remember, one of the, 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 the laws, one of the precepts, the judgments, I want to say judgments, but one of the, the commands, it's a better word, that God gave for Israel was every six years till the ground, you know, reap the harvest, take from it, and, and the, the grounds, the land that God has provided is going to be bountiful. He's going to provide for you. He's going to give you what you need. But in the seventh year, the command was to no longer do that, but to let the land rest, right? To, to give it a time to, to rejuvenate for the next six years, right? And so we see this as a commonality throughout scripture. We see it in the very first two chapters when God creates the heavens and the earth and everything else that we see. He does it in six days and on the seventh day, he rests. We see it later on when he establishes the Sabbath day for the very first time with Israel. He tells them, look, I'm going to provide you manna from heaven, right? This nice, sweet bread that's going to be, you know, out on the ground. You can go get it every single day. But on the sixth day, I want you to get double portion because on the seventh day, you're not going to go out. So that double portion on the sixth day is going to provide you for the sixth and the seventh day. Why? Because he wanted to teach them to rest. Is this all about physically resting? No. Is it part of it? Yes. God wants to teach us that sometimes we do need to rest. Now, in our American culture, we're kind of shifting where we used to be like really, you know, hard workers, you know, and, and then we'd have to be forced to rest. But now we're shifting to like, we're resting too much and now we're being forced to work, right? There's that fine balance that we need to find where we need to, to do, we need to work. I mean, Paul even says it like, if you don't work, then you're not worthy of, you know, Eating, like if you have the capability to work and you're just being lazy, you don't deserve to eat. You need to go do your job and you need to work. We see that, you know, with many godly men and women, Ruth being one of them. We study through the book of Ruth. She worked her butt off to, to receive what she needed to receive, but God was also merciful to her, right? So it, it was like a combined effort here. Um, but so it's not all about us just physically resting, okay? But that is part of it. So we work, we do good work, we do it well, we do it unto the Lord, but then we must rest. But part of that, part of that resting is also a trust, right? Because so many times we want to work, we want to do things with our own hands, we want to be in control. And yet when we rest, it's hard because we have to allow the Lord to work. And so then that's when it, tr it, it trickles into this spiritual application where in Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus tells us that, that he has done the work and that we rest in his finished work on the cross. And I don't have to do anything to receive the righteousness of God because he tells us our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags to him. And so I rest in the finished work of, of, of Christ. It doesn't mean that I don't do good works. It just means that I don't try to do good works to, to be right with him. But knowing that I'm right with him because I put my faith in him allows me then to do good works. It motivates me then to do good works. It's naturally in me because the Holy Spirit's in me to do good works. So there's that, that all throughout scripture, right? This, this rest, six days, seventh day rest, the Sabbath. And so with Israel, again, going back to that and where we're at here in Daniel chapter nine is they did not adhere to God's command to allowing the land to rest. And for how many years did they not adhere for the land to rest? You guys remember close 70 times seven. So it was 490 years. They went on without allowing the land to rest, which means that a seventh year came around 70 times in that 490 years. So there was 70, remember last week I couldn't explain this, but essentially that is why they were in uh, captivity in Babylon for 70 years. This was their punishment. This was their, their correction. As we're going to see as Daniel prays this, and we're going to see throughout Daniel chapter 9 that like God did this as a consequence to their disobedience, but it's not just a consequence, but it's also a correction. They work hand in hand. And so they're learning this, right? Like it's, isn't there a reason why, why we correct? Isn't there a reason why there's punishment to doing something wrong? Now, as kids, you under, you may not understand this because you're not parents, but you should understand this concept. 
there's a reason I spank my kid. There's a reason there's a consequence to, you know, whatever it is. He has to go stand in the corner or he loses something. You know, you guys, I don't know, you probably don't get spanked, but you get grounded. I don't know, you lose privileges. You lose probably the biggest thing is you probably lose, you know, access to your phone or something, right? Um, but there's a reason behind that. It's to teach you something. Because you realize that I don't want to do again what I've done because I don't want to lose out on whatever it is. But sometimes it's not even like parents taking something away or punishing. You know, sometimes it's just internally in us where we know that what we've done is wrong and the Holy Spirit corrects us. But here there is a consequence and their consequence is captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And Daniel, if we look in this, Daniel chapter 9 we see here in verse 2 that he is reading what Jeremiah the prophet wrote. You guys remember this from last week? So Dan Jeremiah chapter 25 and 28 or 29, I can't remember exactly. I could probably look at my notes. Is where Jeremiah is writing that all this is going to transpire. And they're going to be in captivity for 70 years. And Daniel, because he's a smart guy, he does the math and he realizes, I've been here for 67 years. Meaning... How many years are left? Three years. So he can see the light at the end of the tunnel. There's only three years left. And I think, you know, Daniel's getting excited. He understands now as he's reading the scriptures that God is, is sovereign, that God is, you know, he, he's showing him what is happening. And he starts to pray that God would, would he, he prays understanding God's character and that he's faithful. If God says it's going to be 70 years, it's going to be 70 years. But he also prays understanding that they deserved what they got and that if God did anything else, they would deserve that too. Cause he constantly says in this prayer, God, you are righteous. You did nothing wrong. We cannot blame you for being in captivity because I can only imagine, you know, 30 years in 40 years in 50 years in 60 years in remember Daniel's life and how hard it was. He was constantly, constantly being challenged. It would have been easy to, to, to be angry at God and to blame him. But even 67 years in, Daniel is one of the righteous men, wouldn't you say? Like Daniel was a man of God. And if there was anyone to be angry, it would have been Daniel because I would have blamed everyone else for, their, for the iniquity of Israel. Daniel's like, dude, I've been doing good. I've been walking with the Lord. I shouldn't be punished with this. But what he does in his prayer is he, he clumps himself within the group, within the nation of Israel. And he says, we have sinned. So even though, you know, from our eyes, Daniel's a righteous man, he still realized that he's not righteous apart from God and that he sins too. And so he clumps himself in, in this prayer saying, we have sinned. And he understands and he prays to God and he confesses, we deserve this. We have sinned. We cannot blame you for any of this. You are righteous. He says this over and over and over again. But God is teaching them a lesson, and we're going to talk about that tonight. But for 70 years, they're in captivity. And in verse 3, it says that he set his face toward the Lord God, and he made requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Now, to briefly go over this really quick, I'm going to ask you a question. When it comes to biblical fasting, what does that mean that we abstain from? Food. Good job. Anything else? No. No. Drink water. That'll be healthy for you because you could die in a couple of days not drinking water. You can go a lot longer without food. But biblical fasting, because Daniel says he's fasting here, and then Jesus even speaks of it in the, in the New Testament. He says, you know, the combination of prayer and fasting, it, it, it goes a long way. What it does for us spiritually goes a long way. And so he couples that here, prayer and fasting. But fasting is always about food when it comes to Scripture. Remember, it's not about fasting from sugar. It's not about fasting. I mean, you, I wouldn't even say fasting. It's not about getting rid of sugar and not eating sugar. It's not about not watching TV. It's not about this or that. Those aren't bad things if you want to, you know, gain new habits. But when it comes to biblical fasting, it's not eating. And verse 4, he says, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said. And confession is a huge part of prayer. It's, confession is a huge part of repentance. Um, and as I told you last week, that what he confesses is very specific. 
And I think if we know what the specifics of our sin is, we need to confess that and not just beat around the bush and pretend like, ah, oh, you know, no, we need to confess what our sin is. And he says, oh Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. So he's acknowledging who God is, his character. He's great. He's awesome. He keeps his covenant. He's faithful. And he says, we have sinned and committed iniquity and we have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. So again, how have they sinned? How have they disobeyed? By not keeping the commandments, by not keeping what God has told them to keep. And again, he says, we have sinned. They departed from his words, from his precepts and his judgments. He says in verse six, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. And he's like, look, not only did you speak to us, but you constantly sent reminders. You constantly sent people to steer us in the right direction. You constantly sent people to, to warn us, right? Because God's long suffering. God's not the type of God that like, think of it this way. What's the wages of sin? Death. How many of you have sinned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you are really perfect over here. We've all sinned, right? We understand that. Well, nobody's going to argue that. How are you still alive? His grace, his mercy, his long suffering. The fact that we're not dead right now shows that he's long suffering. And he's been long suffering with Israel. And if you ever think that God isn't, well, then you have a wrong perspective. Your timeline's off because he is constantly long suffering with us, with Israel. He says, look, he sent prophets. He sent servants to go speak to them, to warn them. And you know what happens is oftentimes, you know, when God is long suffering with us and he, and he sends us and he, he warns us, we have two options. We can either heed the words of the, of the warning or we can reject them, but there's going to be consequences to it. And the fall that's going to eventually come because it will, it's going to be hard. In verse seven, he says, Oh Lord, righteousness. I'm going through this quick because we did this last week. Righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel. Those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Daniel takes responsibility. And many times when it comes to our own lives and we recognize the sin in our own life or somebody points out the sin in our own life, we have a hard time of taking responsibility. And if we don't take responsibility, then, then God can't work on us. Right? God, God is not a, a forceful God. He doesn't do something against, you know, what you want, what you desire. Or you have to one that has, has to, to confess. Does he know it already? Of course. That's not the point. The point is in the confession and the recognition and taking the responsibility is that you, you no longer keep the bondage of, of sin on you and you allow the Lord to help you, to take that burden, to cleanse you, to forgive you. And so Daniel is taking this personal responsibility here with the sin. And that is the very first step for us in our maturity, uh, our spiritual maturity. So here, verse nine, let's start here. Daniel says to the Lord, our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. So Daniel's contrasting here, God's mercy and forgiveness, which is constant with Israel's rebellion in sin and rejection and disobedience against him. This is where Israel is. This is what they do. This is what we do, but this is who God is. And he's always this way. Now, remember from our study a couple weeks ago in Romans, that man is not often a, a good indicator or reflection of who God is, right? The hypocrisy of men doesn't alter or change who God is. And you will see often throughout life and even in our own selves, our own hypocrisy. You'll see other people's hypocrisy. You'll see them fall short. You'll see them rebel against God, disobey God. But that doesn't indicate and it doesn't reflect and it doesn't mean that God's character and who he is has changed because either his people have 
or they've rejected, doesn't change him. He is constant. His character doesn't change. He's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I'm so thankful we have a God who is that way. And so even in the midst of his captivity, Daniel is recognizing that God is compassionate. He's merciful. He's forgiving. And he realized that if God were not, then he would already be dead. That Israel would already be dead. So he says in verse 10, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Now there, it wasn't their only downfall of not letting the land rest. There was many other ways that they sinned against God and didn't follow his commandments. We see that with Israel as we read through the Old Testament, right? Many times they failed over and over and over again. And sometimes it was, it was pretty wicked. It was pretty bad. You guys remember the time of Moses when he was uh, gone for 40 days and what Israel started to do? And you remember in that time, this is very similar as Moses intercedes on behalf of the people to God. God was ready to strike all of them dead. Was God right in doing so and wanting to do so? Yeah. Because he's just and he's righteous. And those who he was going to provide justice upon were unrighteous and unjust, wicked, evil. Moses even being included in that, even though he wasn't in the, the shindig and the party with the rest of the Israelites. But he interceded on behalf of the people. And he said, and he reminded God of his character, reminded of God of his reputation, reminded God of, you know, his long suffering and his mercy and his grace. And guess what? Israel wasn't cast off the face of the earth. God showed his mercy and his grace. As we're going to see here, he's going to extend it again to Israel. And now Daniel is the one who is pleading on behalf of the people. He says in verse 11, yes, all Israel has transgressed your law. Again, what does that mean? His words, and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. So the focus on this verse and the next verse is going to be on Israel's neglect of God's word. And yet, if you look at the, the flip side of that, the contrast of that is when we don't neglect and we actually soak in and we obey God's word, God actually blesses us. And so the application here for us, because we can easily just look at Israel and be like, man, they did horrible. It would have been so easy to follow, you know, God's word. They saw him. They, they experienced miracles, you know, all these things. But yet we, even to a greater extent, have the full counsel of God and his word for us in our own lives. And yet we still don't heed to it. We still don't listen to it and obey it. And I'll, I'll challenge you with this. Sometimes it's hard to obey something that you don't even know. And yet you have been given one of the greatest pleasures, just as Romans chapter three said, that one of the greatest blessings that, it, that the Jews got was that they were, they were given the oracles of God. They had the advantage of having the oracles of God. You have, as a Christian, as a person, I should say, in 2024, right in your lap, you have the oracles of God. And yet many of us don't know what they are because we don't take the time to read them. We don't take the time to soak them in. But yet if we knew them, we should obey them. And there's a blessing from that. God blesses us. And God, listen, when we obey the word of God, the blessings aren't like, oh, you know, God, you know, like I just found a hundred dollar bill, you know, like God's blessing me because I'm being good. No, that, that's, that's not it. What it actually is, is if you find out the wisdom in everything that within scripture, is it's good and healthy for your life. It's good and healthy for your physical life, your mental life, your spiritual life. Do you understand that everything that God has given us for instruction is for, for our godliness, for reproof, for, for edification, for our growth? Like it is the best thing for you. And yet we try other things. And there's other things that help, you know, you can eat healthy, you can exercise, that, that's, you know, that's all good things. And even the Bible tells us to do that. But the best thing for us is to know God's word and to obey God's word. And he blesses us with the wisdom of those things. Because death is found in rejecting God's word. And with death doesn't just come death, but, but the, the, the things that trickle from death. 
you know, the things that trickle from, from Satan and evil, right? The, the bad things, depression and pain and sadness. And it's not to say that once we start to read God's word and obey it, that all those things magically disappear and we'll never have to fight with them again. But there is something to be said that when we do obey God's word, that there is a blessing because it's the healthiest thing for us, for our bodies, for our minds, for our souls. And I think those of you who have walked that path, you know that you can understand the difference. And I think if you're sitting here tonight and maybe nobody even knows this, but you're just having a hard time and life is just down right now. I want to challenge you. Where are you at with knowing the word of God? Because when you know the word of God, you know who he is. And where are you at with obeying the word of God? Where are you at with some of the instructions and the wisdom that is found all throughout scripture? Because it's in there. A lot of it is in there. So again, he says in verse 11, yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. So in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God gave warnings to Israel. Remember, God's long-suffering, so he doesn't just, you mess up and boom, you're gone. No, he's going to be like, hey, dude, you messed up. I need you to, here's a warning. This is what you can do. Um, and this is what's going to happen if you continue to go along this path and disobey. So he says in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 33, he says, I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. So remember how this whole book started in Daniel chapter one, that Babylon came into Jerusalem, basically took over, destroyed it, took a lot of their noble young men and recruited, well, I want to say recruited them. They, they basically enslaved them and made them their own. And for three years, you know, Daniel was in Babylonian university. But not just that, the whole nation was scattered. The temple was torn down. This was their consequence. This was their punishment. And God warned them. If you continue to do, do this, I will scatter you among the nations. So ne God used Nebuchadnezzar. He used the bad for his good. This is what happened. God also gave, a, gave Solomon a warning about the judgment of Israel. And how Israel would face if they wandered from God. But God also gave Solomon a solution to the problem. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, he says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So, so God gives them a warning and he tells them, this is what's going to happen, right? Dude, like if you keep walking along this path, it's not going to end up good, right? It's no different than, you know, a mature Christian who sees a younger Christian doing something stupid and saying, hey, look, if you continue down that path, if you continue doing this thing, if you continue dabbling in that, or if you continue hanging out with these people, this is what's going to happen. We get even the wisdom from Solomon and Proverbs with many of those things. But he doesn't just say this is the consequences of what's going to happen if you continue in it, but he also gives a solution in the other option, the other path. And so he tells them here in 2 Chronicles what they can do. Humble yourselves, pray, seek the Lord. Unfortunately, sometimes we do that when it's too late. Actually, I won't even say it's too late. We do it when we hit rock bottom. It's too late in the sense that it's going to hurt. It's going to be hard. But thankfully, God's long-suffering that when you do hit rock bottom, he still allows you to turn to him. In verse 12, he says, And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us, against our judges, who judged us by bringing upon a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. So Daniel reveals what he understands and he knows, and he confirms that this, what God said would happen, did happen because of Israel's sin and rebellion against God's word. In verse 13, it says, And as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. What did God tell Solomon in 2 Chronicles? This is, this is what you should do. This is the antidote. This is the solution to the problem. If you call on my name, humble yourselves, pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin and I will heal your land. 
So then what does Daniel say in verse 13? He says, we have not made our prayer before the Lord God, our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. He says, we haven't done that yet. And so this is why Daniel's pleading on behalf of the nation and he's casting this prayer before the Lord. And this is a beautiful prayer, guys. Like this is a great example of how we should pray. He's confessing his sin. He's owning up to it. He's not blaming God. He's, he's coming reverently before the Lord, understanding who he is in comparison to who God is. Yet he's still able and capable of coming before the Lord because God is gracious and allows us to, to stand before the throne of grace. But yet he also, he, he trusts and he banks on the character of God as he's making these requests known to him, knowing that this is who you are, Lord. This is, this is what I believe. This is what I trust in. This is who I, kn who I know you to be. And he says at the end of verse 13, if we turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. So Daniel views the goal of God's discipline as this disaster has come upon them and nothing like has been seen before under heaven as teaching them an important lesson, but yet they haven't learned the lesson yet. And I think we need to understand when we do get disciplined, there's a reason behind it. And we have to know what the reason is. We have to learn from it. Many times as, as you know, my kids are growing up, they're young, you know, I'll discipline them for something. I'll explain to them why. Sometimes they're listening, sometimes they're not. And then eventually, you know, I, I need to hear, I'm sorry. But more than that, I need, I need you to show, I need you to prove it by not doing it again. But also I need you to, to tell me specifically what you're sorry for, right? Because if you don't know what you were sorry for, then what lesson are you learning? How do you know to not, what not to do again? How do you know why there is a consequence and a punishment? Why I'm disciplining, right? You have to learn the lesson. And God is purposeful in his discipline for us as his children. And God does discipline. And I think, I don't think, I know, you know, we'll talk through this through scripture, that when God disciplines, he does it because he loves, right? You ever, you ever been disciplined by your parents and they'll say like, this hurts me more than it hurts you? You ever heard that before? Like, hey, I'm about to spank you as hard as I can. No, I'm just kidding. I'm about to spank you or, you know, and like, this is going to hurt you physically, but you're going to learn. Um, but just understand like, this is going to hurt me more because why? Because I, I love you. I care for you. I don't, I don't want to see this punishment come upon you, but because I love you, you do need to face discipline so that you can learn. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't care. And that's called being indifferent. And so for a parent not to discipline a child when they do wrong is not love because it's indifferent. It's a, it's a selfish motivation. It's, it's a non-caring, you know, thing to do. But God cares. And yet that's why he disciplines. And he disciplines those he loves. Proverbs chapter three, verses 11, 12 says, my son or daughter, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Why do I discipline my kids? Because I love them. Why does God discipline me? Because he loves me. And it's proof that I'm a child of his. So don't, don't ever get angry when, when God corrects, because it's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. And it, and it, it allows us to be transformed into what God wants for us, and it's the best and healthiest thing for us. Again, the Lord loves whom he corrects. God's correction of his people is a wonderful sign of his love. And I think this is like innately in us as our flesh and humans is that we, we instinctively want and desire for ease and comfort. And we often wish God would not correct us because of that desire for ease and comfort. Because being corrected is, is not like a comforting and easy thing. Yet, because he loves and delights in us, according to his wisdom, he deals with our sins. He deals with our weaknesses. He deals with our, our failings. And he corrects us appropriately. 
And I'm so glad that God is not indifferent. He is not selfish and that he does care for us. And it's, it's part of his responsibility in the sense that it's part of our responsibility or my responsibility as a father, as a human father, to, to train my children. Just in the same sense as, as your parents and your fathers and your mothers, to train your children. Oftentimes, children are a reflection upon the parents in their training and how they bring them up and how they administer discipline. It's pretty obvious sometimes. You can see certain kids. You guys ever watch the shows like, this might be old, so you might not know, like Nanny 911 or there was one other one. And it was all, always about like unruly kids. And then like this British lady would come in, like this old British lady who just like, no nonsense. Like you could not, you couldn't get away with anything with her, right? She would put you in your place. Well, those kids, you know, even if you go to like Walmart and stuff and you can see kids being unruly and basically running and dominating as the child. And that shouldn't be the case, right? The child should be submissive to the parents. Well, when the parents don't do and they don't take the responsibility of training their kids and disciplining their kids, well, eventually there's going to be a flip and then the parents are going to be submissive to the children. But that's not a good and healthy thing. That's not what God has created. He's designed for the father and the mother to chasten, to administer discipline to the children, to train them up right? And to do it wisely. Hebrews chapter 12 says this in verses seven and eight. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So part of the way to look at this is when God does discipline us, just as he's disciplining Israel here, Israel can blame God and, and be and reject him and be mad at him, or they can realize, Lord, you love me. You care for me because he, he loves those whom he disciplines and he, he disciplines those who are his children, which means that I'm, I'm a byproduct. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a child of God and he loves me and he cares for me and he's treating me as one of his true children. Now understand this too, that discipline from God is not the same as condemnation because God does not condemn his children, but he only disciplines his children. Romans 8, 1, we know this. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's not here to condemn us. Condemnation doesn't have a solution. Condemnation doesn't have a purpose to, um, to, to restore. God is in the business of restoration. Right? So discipline is a form and an act of restoration to, to change you from your wicked ways, from your wrong ways, from your unhealthy ways to good ways, to healthy ways and to restore. That is God's purpose for when he tears us down, when, in a sense, when he disciplines us the same way. Listen, remember, as we were studying in Daniel, I can't remember what chapter it is with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was all proudful and haughty right? Thought he was the king of the world. Thought he was, thought he was God. And what does God do? Does, is God going to be like, oh, dude, like, I don't have time for this. I don't want to do this. You know, no, God cared about Nebuchadnezzar. And so he didn't just allow his pride to continue. There was a breaking point, And at that breaking point, God struck him down and he became a beast of the field for seven years, for seven years. But what was the purpose of that? Was that con to condemn him, to make him look like a fool to all the people around him and his family, and his friends, the whole nation of or the whole nation of Babylon? No, the whole point of it was what? To restore him again, to correct him. Because eventually after seven years, it took him seven years to learn this lesson. He realized, I am not great. God, you're great. And at that point, that's when God restored his sanity and restored him back to his original position. So when God disciplines us, he doesn't do it to condemn. Condemnation is just to strike you down and to never pick you back up. No, he does it for correction and discipline to bring us back up. In verse 14, we got to finish this. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord, our God, is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. Well, what's the disaster again? It's the 70 year captivity that Israel has to Babylon. In verse 15, it says, now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand 
and made yourself a name. As it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. Again, Daniel constantly adding himself to the group that we have sinned in a recognition, a responsibility of their sin and not denying sin. Listen, when we sin, we cannot deny it. We cannot hide it. We cannot be ignorant of it. First John 1 John 1.8 says this, if we, if, if we do, this is where we place ourselves. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We must confess. We must recognize the sin within us. We cannot hide it. We cannot be ignorant of it. Otherwise, we make him be a liar. The truth is not in us and we only deceive ourselves. And so beginning with this verse here, Daniel is going to pray for the restoration of Israel to her land. And he reminds God of when in great power, he restored Israel from captivity in Egypt. This has already transpired. In verse 16, he says, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are reproach to all those around us. Daniel, again, always throughout this prayer, acknowledging God's justice and disciplining them the way that he did. In verse 17, now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations in the city, which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. God is going to answer this prayer not because Israel deserves it. God doesn't do anything for us because we deserve it, because we can't earn it. If we can't earn it, we don't deserve it. But why does he do it? Daniel recognizes it's because of his righteous deeds and his great mercies. Again, God blesses us because of his righteous deeds and his great mercies. Verse 19, we'll end here. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act and do not delay for your own sake. My God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So he asked God to hear, to forgive, to listen and act, to not delay, to do it quickly, to deliver out quickly. He knows like it's, it's three years to come. And God is going to hear this prayer and he's going to answer Daniel's prayer. And he's going to use the angel Gabriel, as we're going to see in verses 20 through 21 next week, that he's going to bring this about. And he's going to give understanding to Daniel. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they actually record how God answered this prayer and restored the people, how the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt and how the temple was built again. And so remember, as we studied this last week, Daniel was about 80 to 85 years old. And we'll close here. And he happens to not return to Jerusalem. He happens to not return to Jerusalem as far as we know. But in Ezra chapter one, verses two through four, it records the amazing decree of Cyrus that freed the Israelites to return. So as he prays this, we see it come to pass later on. And we see this record in Ezra. Look at this. Starting in verse two, it says, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me and has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings in the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus is going to free them, just as God said. And it's not Cyrus is doing per se, because ultimately it's God who's in control and God who's doing this. And so God is faithful to hear the prayers, but he's faithful to show his mercy and he's faithful to restore through his discipline to Israel. So God disciplines and it's good that God disciplines, but it's what we do with it. We have to adhere to it. We have to understand the lesson behind it and we have to be obedient. 